Yo, 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 happy CPI day for those who celebrate. And today we'll be talking about uh, not just one, not two, but three stocks that I've bought uh, back in August. And if you want to know which stock they were and also the reasoning behind it, right? Because also whenever we put something in our portfolio and we put, you know, even if it's just a few hundred, but especially, you know, if we put a thousand or more into that, we should probably have it a little bit thought through, right? In order to make sure that, you know, that thousand, two thousand actually grow to, you know, four thousand, six thousand and more, right? So whenever we are putting our portfolio together, we should be a little bit more thoughtful and spend some spend some time with, with those kinds of decisions, right? Because it will hugely influence the type of life we live in, you know, five, ten years from now. But yeah, let's just jump right into it. And, you know, let me preface this with these three stocks are not the new stocks in my portfolio. My portfolio at the moment is a little over 400,000 euros. So almost, you know, on a good day, close to half a million. And that also means, you know, this just for, for you to understand that I've been doing this for, for some time, right? Since roughly the, the end of 2017. So, you know, it takes time, right? To, to build, a, build a portfolio like that. And that also applies for the three companies that, that I've been talking about, right? Those are not some companies that I've, you know, just like bought now in August and plan to swing it, you know, sell it, you know, next month or so. But these are the companies that I'm really buying for, you know, hopefully the next two, three years, maybe longer. Like there's that ideal golden scenario, right? When we buy a company and then the company just keeps performing and performing that, we don't have any reason to sell, right? So that's kind of the mindset that, uh, you know, I run my portfolio with. And yeah, let's get into the three names. So number one, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, actually it reminds me Twitter or X or, or whatever it's called these days. I prefer X probably, but I'm still getting used to it. So if you follow me on X, you probably know that basically my biggest position at the moment is Palantir. And I've been buying it heavily the, the last year, even, you know, kind of the beginning of this year. Obviously, the company already ran, you know, over uh, basically 100% since the start of the year, something along these lines. So, you know, now it's somewhere around those 15, 16 range. So it almost, you know, sometimes people might think that they've missed the boat, right? But the thing is, at the beginning of the year, and it's not just Palantir, plenty of the companies were having super depressed valuation so you know this is just really getting like if when you jump to the pool right and you kind of you know hit the very bottom and then you can a little bit sprank yourself up so that's exactly the situation that happened with plenty of the companies right so you know i would definitely argue that at these levels you know six seven eight palantir was definitely undervalued by a significant margin that being said now it's maybe a little bit ahead of itself but again, I'm looking for, you know, the next two, three months. And that's why I added a little bit of, into this position, even at these levels, right? I still want to build out my Palantir position a little bit more. That being said, you know, be buying plenty of others. But why I'm buying Palantir in the first place, right? So what does Palantir do in essence, right? So, you know, this is from the basically the website powering AI assisted decision making. And of course, it goes much deeper than that. But the way you can basically imagine it like everything you do around and if you ever work in some organization whether it's you know like a large company or could be even a smaller company right but there is just so much information floating around even in a small company you know you probably have maybe you know especially if you are making some physical products you might have a couple of you know your suppliers then you have the clients and you get all of the information floating you know hey when should certain part maybe arrive when do we need to send it out so um, a big portion of what what humans do, especially now in, you know, kind of like the the later stages of basically, you know, post-industrial age, it's all about making correct decision, making uh, decisions fast and making them reliable, right? Understanding what's happening on a deep, deep level. So, you know, and sometimes Palantir got a little bit obviously caught in this AI craze that we are having, but lots of people see, you know, ChatGPT, Midjourney, you know, some of these image generation tools. So that's like the generative AI, right? That's kind of like that, you know, beautiful to look at. It's, you know, like this exciting parlor trick, but what Palantir does is slightly different. And they've been working on this for a very, very long time, you know, basically multiple decades, but it's real hard cases for AI, right? So it's a practical cases, decision-making, making organizations more powerful. 
So it's not generating fancy images, right? It's making real decisions and real outcomes. And there are so many industries Palantir is actually connected to, right? So it really goes from, let's say, manufacturing, cybersecurity, military, communication, retail, Internet of Things, defense, data governance, AI and machine learning, mobility, robotics, space, natural resources, utilities, legal, and so on and so on, right? And Palantir basically kind of like a leached itself on plenty of those industries and helping them reach that next stage, right? Especially when those companies are, you know, some of those older companies, especially when we are talking about manufacturing, those are often companies that are, that has been here for, you know, multiple, multiple decades, which also means they become a little bit, you know, slower, kind of like the dinosaurs, right? And Palantir is here to reinvigorate them basically. And depending on industry, you know, they are climbing the, these S curves of growth. At different paces, you know, you've probably last couple of months, like Palantir has been crushing it in a healthcare on a, uh, insane, insane numbers, right? But uh, it's also, you know, logistics, obviously the government, DOD, everything. Uh, so depends, different industry, different kinds of progress, but Palantir is definitely making a, a huge strides in all of them. And that's basically seen on the client list, right? So these are basically uh, some of the uh, confirmed client and it's really, you know, starting with some great, great companies. There are now some rumors about, uh, actually just today, there was a, like a flash news that uh, there is a foundry link. So, you know, one of the Palantir products, Foundry and Aramco, which is basically like the, the biggest, uh, basically one of the biggest, biggest companies in the world is testing Palantir at this point, or at least they have their own foundry link, right? So, you know, if that comes true, wow, that would be huge. So, you know, plenty of satisfied customers and we'll get to the point in just a little moment, but yeah, just see this, the sheer scale of this. And at the moment, you know, the Palantir kind of really just only recently at this year uh, entered these initial stages of profitability, you know, finally operating income on a gap basis, right? So general accounting principles, kind of the, you know, the, the hard line, let's say. And this is just really the infant stages, just to make sure, hey, if we want to be profitable, we could be. Um, but, you know, they are going to print money a couple years from now. Just wait and see. And they obviously have Fortress balance sheet, right? This is, and this is also one of the very important po point for me when I'm investing in the companies. Just make sure that the companies are in a solid position, that they are able to weather whatever comes at us, you know, even if, let's say, a recession comes next year, you know, whatever could happen. Palantir has 3.1 billion on the balance sheet. So, you know, at, at the moment, about 10% of the market cap is just in the cash and cash equivalents and, you know, T-bills and so on. And no debt, right? So super position on power, right? That's also what you want to do you personally with your portfolio, right? When you're building it out, have more income than expenses, be able to fund your portfolio every month. So the same applies for companies and individuals. And it's also important to understand the product on a deep level, right? So this is one of my friends basically sending me a message. So let me just read it out. Enterprise SaaS is so damn sticky because it is so hard to get rid of a product your company depends on over time. Right now, Palantir has to put in the work to become the foundation in all these companies. And AI is helping accelerate it because all these companies in other verticals are realizing there's no way to keep up and they need to move fast. I'm realizing the buzz around AI is really helping accelerate that in these talks and all the hype, right? So basically this AI hype is, is helping Palantir a lot, right? To finally shine some light on, on their product. Uh, but that's just a little, my side note. And just to finish it off, but once the foundation starts working and people see the value in the foundation, I think the path to 250 to 500 billion market cap will be building the skyscrapers on top of that foundation and fully modernizing these companies. So we are investing for the market entry, but we got a hold for the real building that will unfold. So, you know, these are some of the my, you know, more software minded friends. You know, I'm still more on that like the finance side. I'm not exactly super techie guy. I mean, more obviously from the user perspective, but not from the back end. So I also like to listen to lots of industry professionals, experts. So, you know, this is one of them kind of really that proof of concept that the product is, is as good as Palantir claims. And obviously one of the short term catalysts that I want to talk about is the potential inclusion in S&P 500, right? So, you know, whenever companies add it to the indexes, that means, you know, all of these passive funds need to buy it. And Palantir is uh, fulfilling almost all of the criteria, right? US company, market cap at least 8 billion, 
highly liquid, at least 50% of shares must be available for public trading, check. It must report positive earnings in the most recent quarters, check. And the sum of its earnings in the previous four quarters must be positive, which they will basically arrive to next quarter. Of course, then it might take a little bit more extra time, you know, a couple, three, six months before the kind of the, the committee decides to actually include them in S&P 500. But it's coming, right? Probably, you know, my expectation would be early 24 and that will put some buying pressure there, right? But that's, you know, really mostly the short term, a little bit of a noise. Uh, so, yeah, might help the stock price in the short term, but really not something that we should focus on that much as long term investors. And uh, Palantir obviously has two main sides, right? Is the government and is the commercial, right? And these are a little bit, um, it's uh, like, a, you know, like that lightsaber with, with two, <laughs> with two. <laughs> oh my God, this is so, so freaking funny. But, you know, uh, Darth Maul, right? With his lightsaber with the two ends. So that's the government, that's the commercial, right? And both of them are kind of operating at, you know, very decent decent pace right and you know sometimes government grows a little bit faster sometimes commercial grows a little bit faster but these two sides are complementing each other right because it's also often the case with lots of innovation comes first from the military right whether you like it or not that's what happens right that's kind of you know historically proven that lots of the you know invention let's say for the second world war eventually get implemented into the commercial sector, you know, helping our world, right? So, you know, lots of the technology that we have around was first developed for the military, let's say the, the GPS is one of the examples, right? And it's also, you know, true for Palanty, right? They learn something implemented for the military first, you know, for, for the government, and then they can use some of the same powers for the commercial, easy as that. And you know, CEO of Palantir, I mean, you know, you, you can think whatever you want, but I definitely love Alex Karp a lot with his approach and he's been instrumental in the company basically since the inception, right? And I've listened to some of the interviews about the early days of Palantir and, you know, sometimes what really stuck with me is uh, how Alex Karp was basically, you know, traveling, you know, most of the, most of the days in, in the year really trying to get those especially in the beginning, it was only government contracts, right? So, you know, talking with all of these agencies. So Alex Carp was basically one of those, uh, you know, sophisticated guys to talk with the, with the government official and persuade them that, okay, hey, we have this tool and it could be really helpful for you, right? And a little bit play these different agencies almost, uh, you know, and I don't remember if it was specific like the, the, the CIA, FBI, or, or if there was some other agency, but I remember Joe Lonsdale, one of the other, uh, co-founders of Palantir to basically talking about that, how Alex Carr was kind of, you know, making uh, all of the other sides aware that, hey, the other side is moving a little bit with the contract, so maybe you don't want to get left behind. And really, you know, it, Alex Carp really got Palantir into that place where it is now, and I think it should see it towards the, the next chapter as well. And obviously, besides Alex Carp, it's lots of employees that are really world class. So, you know, I've even spoken with some, you know, people that uh, went through that uh, interview process for Palantir and it's brutal, you know, the, com the, the people that would have no pro problem getting in, you know, thanks in, in the Google's, Apple's, they had a hard time with, with Palantir. So, you know, Palantir is really that color culture for those hardcore people that are solving the toughest problems and people that are really motivated by solving those toughest problems, right? So that's definitely, you know, great, great sign of a company that operates on a high, high level. And also one of the, if you are a Palantir investor, one of the most important metrics that you should watch is definitely how many deals were closed, right? Because those are kind of like the prerequisites of the future revenue growth, right? Because when Palantir, you know, uh, comes to work with you, uh, usually you, you know, obviously it's, it's, these are big contracts for millions, multiple millions, you know, tens of millions. So initially you usually want to kind of, you know, test it out in a sense, right? So there is like a small use case and eventually, you know, Palantir is maybe implemented in the whole department and eventually in the whole company, right? So the way Palantir does it is basically, you know, prove themselves and then scale, right? Through these different stages. And it's also one of the only companies that is having that uh, IL6 uh, clearance, right? To work with the 
most secret uh, types of missions with the government and the other companies that have it is only Amazon and I think the second one is Microsoft I would need to double check so don't quote me on that but that means okay you have these huge companies that have that clearance and then Palantir that is basically you know one uh, Jesus one one percent of the or you know two percent of the size so you know still a small company but it's playing in that big league and there might be some interesting big um, contracts coming NHS and who knows what comes from the military so all of these are kind of like the wild cards right you know if some of those big contracts roll, roll in we might expect some stock price appreciation because it's basically that proof of concept right that the Palantir can get some of those huge contracts but there are uh, definitely videos that go more in depth into these so I'm not going to spend that much time on that and secondly you know Palantir after a little bit dip in the third quarter of 22 the, the operating income is now back at 22 percent margin so you know definitely great numbers you know very software like numbers so of course again that proved that hey if they can scale revenue keep the opex at level or you know basically grow revenue much faster than the opex who in again a couple of years from now they are printing money right but we have to be a little bit patient as, as an investor right so you know uh, it's not definitely something that you just want to swing in and out of course if you want hey you do you but you know the real value is really in holding the stocks and letting the company become more valuable over time and uh, there's also AIP con coming uh, I think it's tomorrow on the, the September 14th and there have already been a couple of them and basically it's kind of like the showcase of different use cases from a different sectors right so basically Palantir showing off their clients and how Palantir really changed different parts of the business what kind of returns they get and you know plenty of those uh, customers are super satisfied you know showing the real use cases real numbers hey you know Palantir helped to save us you know multiple multiple millions so really you know hard proof that's that's what's needed and ultimately ontology super important context i've put out a video on ontology a couple of days ago so you know if you want to learn more about it definitely go and watch it because it's a super important concept but it's also a little bit more you know philosophical so let's watch that one it was the first company that i bought last month and you know basically i'm still planning to buy the for for the long term like anything under 20 is definitely a decent buy of course you have to run your own numbers but you know like with a company like Palantir you don't have to be necessarily picky right so you know if you're buying it for 15 16 that shouldn't really matter a couple of years from now right but let's go into the second company that I've bought last month and that's so far a little bit similar scenario right as you can see the chart looks uh, a little bit similar to Pal Palantir also you know low numbers four fives you know at the beginning of the year and then kind of quickly jumped into nines nines tens nines so once again that kind of you know that uh, hit the bottom then a little bit sprang from it but again you know still a super nice price as long as you have the long term horizon a little bit maybe like a, a dark point on, on sofi's history is obviously it was originally ipo'd by Mr. Chamad here and uh, you know we know how lots of his specs went and it looks like the sofa is the almost like the only one that actually uh, has some merit but of course you know don't hate the player hate the game so you know if you're listening to Chamad and you kind of hate on him then you should better check yourself and to uh, you know ask yourself why you are even listening to this guy right or you know like you have to understand the incentives right this guy his responsibility is for his you know lps for for his uh you know people that invest with him not to you right so you know take it what it is the same goes for plenty of uh, other these guys so take everything they say with a big boulder of salt but that was at the very beginning right around the ipo and it was completely different company now there is obviously Anthony Noto, right he's a freaking rock star like the pedigree of the guy you know top class top class and he really managed to turn around the company a lot especially and actually so far is relatively uh, recent pick for me right so 
it, it was only recently that I've gathered an, enough confidence to build a little bit out of a better and bigger position. And it was mostly, you know, as I was uh, following the company for already a few, few years at this point, right? And really seeing how Noto managed to turn it around during the whole pandemic scenario, right? Where SoFi was initially heavily reliant on the student loans, right? And the refinancing, all of this kind of stuff. And of course, with the COVID and everything, the student loans were paused. So what's there to do? So obviously super precarious situation for SoFi, but hey, they've managed, they really, you know, managed to grow immensely, even despite all of these, you know, headwinds. So, you know, kudos to Antoni Noto. And it looks like the company is on a great trajectory, right? I mean, you know, like the stock price can fluctuate as it usually does. But usually businesses are somewhat predictable, right? I mean, just look at the members of SoFi, right? So basically, really quite steady growth, I would say. And it's, yeah, like, I mean, you see the trend, right? It's nice and simple compared to stock price that kind of jumping, you know, up and down. So, you know, that's what you want to see. Business that's growing and, you know, the numbers are just great. And it's also, you know, great about the overall, let's say, let's call it the marketing or kind of like the general knowledge about the company, because of course, you know, back in 2020, it was still a little bit, you know, unknown little, you know, kind of financial company, but over the basically past year or so, it really managed to gather a lot of attention, right? So this is basically from Google Trends. So yeah, it's really slowly but surely becoming a household name for the for the banks kind of that, you know, like a because who else is there for the banks, right? So, you know, people usually either trust some of the super big guys, you know, like JP Morgan is probably the greatest US bank, you know, with Jamie Dimon at the helm. That's kind of that epitome of, you know, like the the stability and that, you know, big establishment. Some something that we can trust, but at the same time uh, it's not something uh, exciting or not something that's like you expect it to be a bank, right? You just put your money there, it's safe, it's reliable, but that's it, right? You don't expect more. But the SoFi is doing that a little bit of a more, right? It's that bank with uh, lots of fintech flavor, really taking care of its customer like a deeper level. Um, so that's what great, right? And that's also why it's, you know, growing so heavily. Also, net income is slowly hopefully becoming positive it's supposed to i think yeah i have the slide here so you know on the recent conference call basically so far plans to become positive uh, net income positive and uh, in the fourth quarter of 23 so that would be quite a big thing you know whenever the company switches to profitability that's usually kind of a nice jump in the stock price you know that kind of prove that hey you know we can become profitable and if company is profitable there is not really that much risk anymore, right? You know, as when the company is not profitable, they are burning money, you know that there is the end of the runway. But if the company is profitable, it can definitely, you know, continue at least exist in its current state, right? So super nice to understand that. And besides that, um, Anthony Noto basically said that, or he plans to, he has that vision and plan to get so far into top 10 US banks based on the market cap. So obviously very bold claim, which would mean so far should get somewhere to like a hundred billion market cap, right? So that's still quite a long way. Uh, but you know, like that's what it is, right? With these kind of growth companies, the vision is there. It can definitely happen. You can see the numbers, you can run the numbers. And now it's about execution, right? So that's why you want to check the management team to how credible they are, right? How likely is it that Noto will actually put it into, into top 10? And I would say, you know, top 10 might be maybe a little bit of a stretch depending on the time horizon, right? But it's definitely, you know, like even if he managed to get it to, let's say 50 billion market cap, okay, you are still doing so well on the SoFi position at this level, you're still beating the market with such a significant margin even then right so you always want to maybe when you are doing your projections a little bit downplay what the management saying and make sure that hey even if only half or two-thirds of the things that management says will happen am i still making money oh i am okay maybe let's jump into that one so that would be my two cents and actually noto has quite some incentives to to get so far to some very respectable numbers right 
because he has a specific uh, performance stock units. So basically he'll, he will be awarded some specific stocks, right? You know, completely as, as part of his compensation plan with that caveat that the company needs to trade at 25, 35 or $45 by the end of i think it's 25 so you know roughly three years two years or no it was i think 26 don't quote me don't quote me, on, quote me on that but i think it was 26 so basically he has three more two and a half three years to get to these numbers to be awarded these specific performance units so you know the incentives are perfectly aligned right that's what i also like hey you know you'll be rewarded handsomely you see your guy but hey, you need to make sure shareholders a lot of money, right? That means we are all, you know, on the same boat, rowing in the same direction. So this is perfect. And then also, obviously, SoFi is growing very fast compared to all of the other banks. Of course, you know, hey, all of these banks are kind of in these late mature stages. So it's hard to compare. But hey, you know, growth is growth and I'll take it. And it's also not valued at some extreme ratio, right? Even after this recent run up, if you compare uh, price to book ratio, which is often one of the metrics used for the banks, it's basically on par with JP Morgan and JP Morgan is growing, you know, not so much, right? Compared to SoFi really growing fast and valued same. So, I mean, I think I'm getting a good deal on this one. <laughs> And as I've talked about, you know, really pleasing your customers, they have this slogan, get your money right, you know, spend, save, invest, borrow, refinance your student loans. And it's really, you know, a little bit teaching this younger generation, you know, millennials, Gen Z to be a little bit more mindful, thoughtful about money, you know, teaching them, offering them, a, you know, a nice incentive. So, you know, customers in mind. And then maybe the last thing to to talk about is the mode, right? It's kind of that epitome, you know, uh, Warren Buffett talks about it a lot. Uh, mode is that kind of like, a, what kind of defense do you have around other companies, right? If someone else comes, how, how easy is it for them to steal your lunch, right? So, you know, some companies have really white mode because of a different reason. And in my mind so far at the moment is in the stage of building that mode. It doesn't have it yet to a great extent, but it's building it, right? Because of course, you know, with the banks, usually, you know, people have one main bank, right? Because then also when you are using different products, when you, you know, also have your maybe checking account, savings account, maybe you have some investing with them, maybe you have some loans with them. If you have all of them, you usually get some, you know, bonuses, incentives. So, so far is basically planning to really acquire lots of quality customers from that millennial Gen Z generation and basically grow with them, right? So yeah, build that mode noto, build it out. And so yeah, that was so far. So, you know, in my mind, anything under 10 is definitely a decent buy, uh, you know, run your own numbers. It's a growth stock, right? So it might end up, you know, it might end up good really good awesome right so there is quite a variance in the outcome so you always have to be a little bit more mindful uh and um you know run your own numbers right really try to put it pen paper excel spreadsheet whatever works for you but see how likely are some of the scenarios right and on twitter i'm basically outlining some some of these so definitely follow me there but let's get to number three so number three position that I'm buying, you know, in August and I'm probably be buying in September now as well is AMD. And you might probably be thinking, okay, but uh, you know, Nvidia is the talk of the town. Well, yeah, it is, it is for, for very good reasons actually. But that also being said, you know, like if everyone is going this way, maybe it's time to a little bit look this way, right? Maybe there might be some, something interesting. And, you know, AMD is definitely go, doing a couple things right. And I will touch upon one of the most important kind of more like the product and technical side that they are doing well. Um, but there is no doubt that at the moment, you know, Nvidia is real on top of the game with their AI chips and everything. That's also why their chips, you know, are the, you know, the highest quality, deserving the highest margins. Uh, but AMD is slowly ready to disrupt them, right? And all of these, actually I have one more chart here. Uh, as you can see, you know, AMD, NVIDIA for the past five years, 
they are kind of trading in a similar pattern, right? Lots of the times the companies that are in a, you know, same industry that are a little bit, you know, like, I mean, chips, they are different, but they are still somewhat commodity, right? So you have to be a little bit mindful about that. But it's really only at this point and this year that AMD started to underperform and Nvidia performed super, super well. And I expect that this gap between the two will eventually close at some point, right? And why it's going to happen? Well, for one uh, relatively, uh, I wanted to say simple reason, but it's not as simple, but it's, you know, and it took me a long time to kind of realize this. And also there is a lot of knowledge about the, all of the chip manufacturing to go into that. So let me try to explain it, you know, at relatively simple terms. When you are producing these chips, you're basically, it's a super high precision operation that doesn't always end up with with the end end product right there are lots of the chips that are simply faulty because of the mistake in the manufacturing right that just happens right and everybody's scouting with that but the way nvidia is producing these chips is that they do one big monolithic chip super quality chip which then they can have a high margin on it's a top class but since it's one big chip if there is some small mistakes in just a part of the chip, they just have to throw it all away and they have to produce a new one and a new one. And maybe, you know, they have certain yield, right? Only certain portion of the chips are produced, you know, accurately. With AMD, they are doing what's called chiplets. So they are making these like a smaller units that they are connecting together. It produces slightly worse results, so it's not that the high, high, high class of the chips. But then again, if one chiplet is produced wrong, they can just replace it with another chiplet and they don't need to throw everything again, right? So maybe you have three correctly, one is incorrect. Well, you throw this one out, you get new one in and hey, you can ship it, everyone is happy. So that's why AMD is going to perform definitely nicely and also with chips. Even if you buy Nvidia at this point, it's definitely all, all overvalued. Of course, it depends on the different metrics. I, I would say, you know, like you're definitely missed the ball to some extent, right? But whatever happens, you know, over the rest of the decade, kind of this big social social trend, kind of the geopolitical trend, there will be mm, significantly higher needs for the compute, right? So, you know, you can buy different companies at AMD and NVIDIA, you can, you know, buy ASML, you'll probably also do well. So really like most of the people that understand chips should probably have some in their portfolio, right? Because of this huge mega trends in the society, you know, I have this book called uh, Super Trends on my bookcase that's basically talking about it. So, you know, whichever company you choose, hey, you know, you do you, I've chosen AMD for those specific reason. But, you know, I would say lots of those companies in the chip, either manufacturing, design or, you know, somewhat connected to that ecosystem will outperform the market in my mind, right? Significant portion. And it's also, you know, one of the companies that's really a pleasure to work in. These are reviews from the glass door. So, you know, majority of the employees approve of the CEO. And, you know, satisfied employees means business that's high performing as kind of like the, the general rule. And then basically, you know, Lisa Su, the CEO of the company, took over back in, back in uh, 2014 when the AMD was a two buck chuck, right? And since then AMD 106 at the moment. So, you know, all of this here is because of Lisa Su. I, I wish I saw her vision sooner. I mean, I started investing somewhere here in 2017, 18. So, you know, I wish I bought at this point, but hey, you know, I bought some other stuff that made me so, so much money. So, hey, you know, you, you cannot win them all, right? Uh, but yeah, that means really I'm seeing that AMD over the you know, by the end of the decade, market outperformance in my mind is almost guaranteed. Of course, there might be some slightly better picks. Of course, if you would have bought AMD those six, seven years ago, you would, ha, ah, Jesus, then you are probably somewhere completely else. But hey, even from now, market outperformance, that's what we are aiming towards, right? So that's basically all I have for AMD. And thanks for joining me, guys. So I know this was a long one. If you managed to stay all the way up until here, 
let me know what stocks are maybe you buying what was the last stock that you bought that would be super interesting and you know maybe if you disagree with some of the points or if you have some additional thoughts then definitely let me know either here in the comments or follow me on on x slash twitter and yeah talk to you soon take care